We're live again, man. It's Monday. On Monday. Like we, yep. like we normally do. Yep. Back to Mondays a little bit. A little wonky with the holiday schedule. But Can't really decide whether we're, we're going at noon or uh, 3 o'clock, man. We're just flipping it up. You know? <laughs> uh, today, man, uh, I got a babysitter to go out uh, at 2 o'clock uh, with my wife. For, for I mean, we're going to do uh, New Year's Eve at like in 3 the, o'clock in old, the afternoon. Old people time? Old people time. Yeah, <laughs> dude, yeah, old people time. So that's why we're uh, going a little early today. Uh, but I think, man, this is going to be it. I think after this, like uh, after New Year's, we can get back we're to like back regular structural. That'll be nice. Yeah, like all the vacations are gone, Monday, man. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Maybe even more. But, uh, yeah, we're going to get back to rhythm. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've been writing that calcium reactor video today, all day. Uh, that one we talked about on Friday, man. It's mm-hmm. coming together. It's, uh, How many pages? Know, already, man. There's like, there's like six or seven. So, uh, I can't even. It's going to probably it's gonna be, be a 20, like 30 a, minute. Uh, no, it's already that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, well, letting people roll in here. Today, we're going to talk about fish food. You know, we got some fish food up here. We're going to talk about coral food. We're going to yeah. talk about all the different ones, man. And, you know, people get asked, or ask us all the time about the different ones. And, you know what? We were talking about today, and we've got stuff to say about it. So uh, we'll share with, uh, uh, what we think about some of these things. We'll also go ahead and uh, answer all our questions, because this is Ask Beers TV. Yeah. All right, uh, we're going to start it off, though, with what? The, the thing that we've gotten away from, well, I would, people were wondering, I about their orders and their refunds and mm-hmm. on Friday. But we normally have a Friday giveaway. Uh, but what we were trying to do is, hey, for those preferred reefers who have orders in the last 30 days or who have stuff in, this stuff in their shopping cart, I go in there just before we come into this uh, live on Monday, and I look for stuff to refund. And I think we got a few. Yep. All right. Some well, so ones. it's a mix of people who have uh, stuff in their carts and people who actually bought stuff. Uh, today, looks like all uh, people actually bought stuff. So, yeah. uh, all right, so let's do the first one here. And uh, it looks like Enrique Hernandez from Huntington Park, California. Nice. You know what? He has uh, $72.85 in points going back to his account. Uh, I got some zooplankton from Brightwell Aquatics. Oh, cool. He's got uh, some extra thick super glue gel from Bulk Bee Supply, Ocean Wonders Coral Forceps, a uh, BRS. A five inch SPS bone cutter, uh, some phytochrome color enhancing phytoplankton from Bitewell Aquatics. You know what? Today's topic. Cool. Yeah, I mean, that really is, actually. That's pretty, <laughs> I mean, did you cheat? No, I didn't. Uh, no. <laughs> All right, here you go, man. Here's the middle one. All right, I've got one. Uh, let's see here. This is Michael, Michael Fullington in Westchester, Ohio. And uh, Michael's got $95. It looks like, uh, actually, no, it's a. Looks like 101 right on the bat. We're at 101.45. Anyway, what did Michael get? A half a gallon of premium rocks 0.8 uh, carbon, some braided vinyl tubing in the three quarter in the one inch, uh, some soft silicone tubing, and then a six stage f- uh, filter kit for the RODI replacement filter kit. Solid. So making some new water and adding some carbon to the thing. Just some. Some regular right. maintenance stuff. I mean, we got Congrats. up to 143 people, so this is working out good. Give out a few things, then we can get to the meat of it. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Daniel uh, Curry from uh, Chapa, Chapa what? Chapa Aqua? Chapa Aqua. Chapa Aqua, New York. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, it is interesting. <laughs> uh, so, he's getting some. Uh, or he's getting $97.25 going back to his account. Uh, Aptasia X, two ounce, uh, sup, uh, Sally Furt, flatworm exit. Uh, some uh, Strontion from this name Smith from Brightwell Aquatics. Brightwell, they, yeah, you, know, you can know right away. Okay, oh, we back? look at that, we're back. <laughs> that was... I mean, I, would, I hope so. Anyway, is everybody still here? Eh, we're live so, for about hey, six seconds. Can you move yeah, that little on, sound level thing for me? For some reason, uh, our, our all right, this is there you go. All right, well, I don't oh, know. Let's... Thanks for staying. I don't well, know what happened there. Boom. Uh, yeah, that's pretty crazy. And we actually got new. We actually got a new pro, uh, platform. This is the one of the older ones that we were using. This is the Ecam Live. But we, uh, when Dave gets back, he's refining that new platform that we have, where we can do YouTube and Facebook from one single place. And I think that the money that we spent on it, it's going to be better than this Ecam. I certainly hope so, man. <laughs> that yeah. was that was yeah. a bummer. All right, well, all right, good to see you guys. Thank you. Yeah, we're right. back now. All right. Well, we, I don't know. We gave away those three orders. So uh, anybody wants to get three orders, uh, you know, we just do occasionally whenever yeah. we feel like it. So uh, be a preferred reefer. Little link in the. Box bottom of the footer of every page man you get some points get free stuff, Keep some stuff all right there. so uh all right we're going to talk about fish food today so feel free to uh, ask any questions coral food really just nutrition for the tank 
And uh, I thought kind of we'd just kind of go through it and we'd share, uh, you know, dry foods, frozen foods, algae foods, uh, do-it-yourself foods, uh, supplements, powders, liquids, live foods, auto feeders, uh, do-it-yourself, rod oh, nice. feeders. Oh, my gosh, that's a lot of stuff. And uh, just kind of talk about a little bit what we like, what we don't like, mm -hmm. uh, and which one of them um, each one of us would use. So we're going to start with uh, dry foods, you know, like pellets, all this kind of stuff here, mm. uh, flake foods and whatever. Yeah. And I think i just start with you, man. What uh, what do you like about dry foods? Oh, well, for the longest time, I never used dry foods until actually until I got here. Uh, I was always using frozen foods and stuff. But now that I see my, what's the biggest thing I like about dry foods, uh, after we talked about WWC and seeing how they feed every hour on the hour, and I'm not at home, uh, I can feed dry foods from an auto feeder uh, while I'm not there. So I mean, the, just that alone, being able to feed when you're not there, which I mean, it takes pressure off of you when you get home, maybe if you forget to feed. I used to go home and forget to, you know, mix up or thaw out some defrost or defrost some food, put it in the tank, or I'd be rushed in the morning and I could, forgot to feed or couldn't be able to feed. Uh, you know that the auto feeder's got you covered. Yeah. Uh, that's probably my biggest one. I said dry foods is definitely like you said. If I could put it in one word, it'd be convenience. Convenience, right? Like yeah. I, I can put it right at the tank. I can sprinkle some out. I can put it in an auto feeder. I can do whatever I want to do. A couple other things I'd say is the stuff is super nutrient dense. Yeah. And so, like, uh, if you think about like a teaspoon of pellets versus like a cube of food, like uh, you know, volume wise, it might be take up about the amount, same amount of space. But I bet you the pellets has. Uh, you know, probably something in the magnitude of uh, 10 times as much actual nutrition in it. I mean, maybe it's five times, but like I was looking at one of the foods today, uh, the frozen foods, and it's like 80% water. So, <laughs> yeah, when you take out 80% of the water, man, what's 20 left? 20% food. Yeah, so I guess uh, it'd be five times. I'm sure there's still some water in the dry foods too, but yeah, so it's super nutrient dense. So what the fish does eat, is real high in you know presumably you know nutrition nutritive content being fats and mm -hmm. proteins and and uh and whatnot you know so like yeah I, I like to feed them uh not like uh solely but like i don't have any problem with feeding the the pellet type foods you know though like there are some things that i don't like about it but i'm trying to think if there's anything else i specifically like i like that you can get that some of them float some of them sink mm -hmm. uh i like that they break up and that they uh, yeah. feed corals and stuff when they like you know eventually they'll you know disintegrate into uh like a, a powder mm -hmm. essentially yeah uh this one right here man what were you saying you were telling me about it earlier the oh, crossover. this crossover diet? Yeah, crossover diet. Apparently they bind. Uh, this is a, the crossover diet from Neptune Systems that works with the uh, – it's perfectly sized for the automatic fish feeder. But uh, they bind it with, like, coral food. So I would imagine something like reef chili or, you know, something in those – powdered uh, type foods but they they bind that into the food actually so when it breaks down it actually does provide some uh, other types of coral foods out there specifically so uh, all right yeah so you know uh, there's also like you know some downsides to pellet foods man maybe you could try it in i guess uh, the i mean it's nutrient dense so you have to be kind of a little bit more spar more sparingly with your fish feed or with your feeding make sure that the fish actually get it in their mouths rather than you know sometimes with the uh the frozen food i'll just take a turkey baster and i'll squeeze a whole bunch in there i'll spray it in the tank and then walk away because I, I know it's kind of floating around fish are eating it and, you know they're kind of working on it sometimes that dry food or sometimes those those dry foods will you know if they don't catch it on the way down to the bottom then it gets on the bottom if you don't have anything that feeds or actively feeds off the bottom uh then they might not catch it and then eventually they're just going to break down into the tank so uh if i'm feeding the same amount of dry food that i am frozen Frozen food, uh, it's a lot more nitrates, phosphate potential down the road. Uh, and then some fish that I've had just don't eat dry food. I don't know. It's true, man. Uh, yeah, I say the same thing, man. Uh, frozen food, way, 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 way more forgiving. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, to overfeed frozen food, you kind of got to, like, think about it, you know, <laughs> because... Like, uh, again, like that teaspoon kind of analogy. If I put a teaspoon of, uh, you know, of uh, pellet food in here, it would probably seem like a lot. But, like, the equivalent amount of frozen food, I'd probably have to go and take, you know, seven, eight you know, cubes of food to put the same amount. Like, nobody yeah. would do that. It's like, so just common sense kind mm -hmm. of stops you with uh, frozen food uh, from overfeeding. And uh, so it's also, like, harder to do. 
you know, so just more or less likely you're going to do it. I have to go to the freezer and get some and put it in there. Whereas with pellet food, I can, you know, just throw it in there. The frozen food seems to not like all float and stuff too, so mm -hmm. it seems to stay in the water column where fish can yeah. eat it. And you know, with the uh, dry food, man, like tons of it can go down the overflow. That's one of the reasons I never feed flake food. Not only flake. I was going to ask you about that. Would you ever feed, or have you ever fed flake? Foods? I have maybe like my very first week of my first tank. <laughs> uh, but like, uh, it, it's not like it's bad per se, but it, like it's so abnormal from the yeah. normal fish. I've never seen any fish here like like it. The one I did try was uh, way back when they had cyclo. Oh yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the dry stuff. Like, what's it? What's it called? Cycl cycle peas or something like Cyclopes, that. Cyclopes, uh, yeah, flakes. Yeah. 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 So I tried that. They didn't actually like that, but uh, uh, even that one, I thought that maybe they would like. But the flakes, man, just tend to I think be a, more of a freshwater type fish yeah. food, and they float and uh, they often go down the overflow. Mm -hmm. But so that's a big deal. Like if you're using you know these prepared foods like that, they go down the overflow, they get caught in your sump, and they just decay. Yeah. Again, why it's so easy to overfeed and you know if you have a nitrate or phosphate problem uh, and you know the thing that we've been preaching a lot lately is uh, if you have rising nitrates and phosphates uh, there's an imbalance in your equation uh, meaning that I'm either adding too much or I'm not exporting enough yeah. so decide which one you're gonna fix you know if it keeps going up you either need to improve the quality of your export methods or stop putting so much in. Or both. Yeah, or both, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, like, uh, you know, the easiest way to do that probably be, like, stop feeding. If you're feeding pellets, man, just stop. And go and feed frozen, frozen food, you yeah. know, uh, or feed half as much pellet. So you know, one or the other, man, and then see if it stops. Like lo and behold, man, well, it's because he wouldn't put so much in there, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, so I, I guess that would be like uh, uh, dry foods. Also, uh, you know what, man, tend to be fake. Like uh, oh, you know, not fake, but you mean talking about like binders and stuff? You talk about the quality, like equated to like cat food, right? Yeah, yeah so. man. There's various qualities of cat food out there. Like I, I don't want to get sued, so I'm not going to say it. But like uh, the uh, crappiest, you know, cheapest, <laughs> you know, cat food or dog food you could buy, like on the shelf, you I'll know. Live. Uh, you know, kitty mix or whatever it yeah. might be. Hopefully, that's not a real one. Uh, <laughs> you know, kitty mix out there. You know, it costs a buck ninety nine for cheap. a box of yeah. it. Well, then there's uh, you know your blue buffaloes and stuff of the world where mm -hmm. you know they're trying to like put as much protein and natural diet and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I still it's a it's a dried up pellets. So I don't know how natural it is. Yeah. But like it, it you know they're trying to get as close as humanly possible to natural you know diet. the natural yeah. diet of the animal like. Almost certainly that's going to show in results. And, like, I can tell you for sure, you know, I fed my animals, like, uh, the actual just, like, chicken you just threw in the blender and ground it up. Uh -huh. I mean, we didn't do that, but the store I buy it from does. And, you know, lo and behold, man, like, the cat's coat is, like, way, way softer. It's not losing its hair anymore. Like, all of a sudden, it's, like, like even though we feed it twice as much, there's, like, one-third the turds. You know, <laughs> like, uh, they don't stink. Like, it's, like, you know, oh. it's probably uh, liver and kidney issues you're, like, not, you know, promoting. So now this stuff is going to cause, like, immediate mortality. Like, I feed a kitty mix and the thing just falls over and yeah, dies. Yeah, yeah. But, like, long-term, uh, long man, I'm caring for my pets here, you know. So some of these dry foods, man, definitely going to have uh, different kind of quality standards. And, like, there's a couple of ways you can probably identify that. Like Cost? Two. Well, cost is usually a good sort indicator. Yeah. I mean, not always. Sometimes they're just making more money off you. But uh, <laughs> okay. I would say often, man, it is, especially if it's coupled with uh, with other things, man. Uh -huh. And it's right on the package, man. So, like, oh, yeah. you know, pick up one of these guys. Uh, and so this is a Reef Nutrition stuff. You know, and this is definitely, you know, you know, like 12 bucks for this thing, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, uh, equivalent sizes, like the cheapest fish food out there is probably three ninety nine. A couple bucks. Yeah, yeah. it's... it's you know, it's a different tree in Kitty Mix and Blue Buffalo, probably. Yeah. And, like, hopefully Blue Buffalo is okay with me representing them as a good one. <laughs> uh, but ingredients here, man, is uh, not, you know, apple peels immediately or whatever. It's krill meal, fish meal, squid meal. Uh, where the hell is that? Who knows? Uh, but, you know, uh, calcium phosphate and whatever, wheat flour is in there, and uh, fish oil. And, mm -hmm. you know, so the, but the predominant ingredients in this thing, man, is krill meal, fish meal, squid, squid meal, meal, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then coupled with that, there's only like two things that I, I would say. There's vitamins and nutrition and stuff in these things, but like the two things, if I had to look at them and decide, like, you know, is this a good food or not? Yeah. 
I'd start with crude protein, which is the you know percent, you yeah. know what it's gonna, the coral and the fish are going to make up its uh, you know tissue mass out of the percentage. It's forty nine percent in this case. Uh, what is that one? Forty six percent in this crude Four, protein. Forty six percent, and so like a lot of them are down in the thirties, man. So like this is a way higher you know nutritive content, and not, not only that, but like uh, with the crude fat too. So fat and protein. So that's, you know, make up tissue and provide energy to do so. The fat is going to provide the energy, 14%. Most of the ones I've seen out there are in the, like, 6 7 you know, 8% range, you know. So, you know, just look for a, a dried food, man, that has a lot of nutrition in it, being protein and fat, uh, and hopefully vitamins and whatnot as well. But, mm -hmm. like, you know, all of them are going to have some kind of, uh, like, uh, you know, preservative in it, you know. Uh, all of them are going to have, you know, most of them tend to have like some kind of weed or, you know, uh, brewer's yeast yeah. or, you know, oddball stuff in there, yeah. you know, like, it, cause it's definitely not a shrimp, uh, in its entirety, you know, uh, well, that's another thing. To, another point to take in here is like the size of the pellets and stuff. Is there's uh, there's a different ton of different types of dry foods out there. A ton of different sizes that you can get from you know super large pellets, sort of like these seaweed extremes. You can get those in fairly large pellets, uh, all the way to some that almost look like just meal. Uh, it's not really pelletized, and I don't. Some of them don't. Maybe call granules or something rather than uh, rather than the the actual pellets. Uh, but you know. Mirroring that to the size of oh. mouth on your fish, so yeah, hold there for a second. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But yeah, uh, I mean, I, plenty of times you see like the large fish in here, fairly large. Almost every single one of them have a, a significantly large mouth, so they can almost take the larger size of pellet. Uh, inherently, with that larger pellet, breaks down larger too. But uh, yeah, size in it. There's, there's, and they're labeled on there. A lot of them will have a, a ruler next to their pellet size. You got to get an idea of what to expect, but. In most cases, I'd say, like, if I was going to pick some, unless I have really small mouth fish like antheas or maybe some some fish down in the bottom, gobies or something that have really small mouths, the standard, like, medium to large size probably covers almost a lot of them. I, I think imagine. medium for reef fish is probably yeah. the most common. Yeah. And then, like, I think it's a big deal for the things like antheas and stuff that are used to eating tiny little bits of plankton or something, you know, in the ocean. Um, feeding them really small, easy to digest foods. Mm -hmm. We scroll up just a little bit. There was a good uh, question in here. Other direction. I'm sorry. My up. Uh, oh man, I think we lost. Ah, YouTube briefer. Uh, Chroma Boost is a great fish food. Uh, the clown's uh, color have uh, definitely improved. Oh, cool. So, you know, this is a reef nutritionist food. It was brought in pretty recently. Yeah. You know, this is like a uh, food that, you know, that's like used in hatcheries and, you know, like I would say like a professional type food, mm -hmm. you know, where feeding the fish, you know, produces financial results. Uh, and, you know, not only just the fish needs their survive, man, but they need to look good. So in this case, the uh, clown's color is definitely improved. And, yeah, I mean, a lot of the color pigments that a lot of animals get from is from their food, you know, specifically fish uh, for sure, mm. uh, possibly even in coral. I, I don't know if they would get fluorescent pigments from that or not, but oh. definitely the Def fish, fish do. Like, uh, there's definitely red uh, pigments and stuff in the fish that make dramatic difference. Specifically, I know a lot of people caught talk about it in clowns. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. You want to? We're gonna we're kind of gonna, gonna hit on Lynn's question or Lynn's okay statement there later, but he's talking about. Uh, a method to make an auto feeder from frozen food. I've seen some really cool stuff on the Reef Hobby forums where you get a little mini fridge with some dosing pumps and these elaborate systems inside that spin and defrost and suck the food out and push it in there and then backfill. I mean, you can get pretty elaborate with some of those DIY ones, but uh, oh, no. I've seen them out there. We're going to talk about DIY I've feeders never seen and stuff like a, that down the road. But a frozen fish auto feeder. Like, yeah. I don't know how I've never hit that thread. Yeah, I've man. seen it. Wow, that's yeah. pretty cool. Uh, so uh, I'll just go ahead and then skip on the last piece of the dry food, man. It, uh, if you could make it better, or which one would you use here? Mm. Uh, so, like, I don't know about making it better in this case, but, mm. like, uh, uh, which one would you use? I mean, you pretty much hit it with the crude proteins and the fats and stuff. Uh, we've, uh, we've used this crossover diet stuff uh, in this tank and several other tanks. Uh, I'd probably go with that one. I, I'm not... Like I said, I have never really been much of a dry food type of feeder myself. I've always mixed up my own concoctions, DIY food or do frozen food. But uh, there's some there's some sustainable aquatics ones that Chad uses for his hatcheries and, mm -hmm. and for all of his fish breeding. Smaller size I think pellets. Think that might be actually the same as some, but of, these, uh, some of the behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. could be. Yeah, 
But you now crossover diet. This TDO stuff, we like we just brought it in. It's pretty interesting. There's a whole beginner pack. So I mean, you have this A1, B1, B2, C1, C2, different sizes, different things in there too. So that'd be pretty interesting to try out and mix up. I'm, I'm in agreement. I mean, like I don't give a crap about the label on it. The yeah. label could be super awesome uh, and say super deluxe fish on the front, man. But what I care about is nutritional value yeah. of it. So I'm gonna read the label of it. I'm gonna look in it. If it says that it has. Uh, uh, you know, beef hearts in it, like, I don't know, I, I don't know, or, uh, you know, if it's predominantly a Meal bunch of, uh, or binder, yeah. or like, yeah, like plant life and, you know, papayas and stuff, like, I don't know, I don't know, man. it's just not for me, but uh, it doesn't mean it's bad, it just means that that's not what I'm going to use, but I'm going to look predominantly actually at the nutritive uh, quality of the food being just the crude fat and crude protein of it. And I'm going to use the one that has the highest one, you know, within a reasonable budget. Mm -hmm. uh, I think these are probably similar size. And so the Neptune one here, crude protein 46, mm -hmm. crude fat 16. Uh, so crude protein on this uh, TDO uh, Chroma Boost uh, 49, uh, fat 14. And that's pretty much what I've seen on a lot of things is like, uh, the best ones, it starts to get hard to get both. Yeah. And so you start to see, you know, Some not many are best in the both. Yeah. In both. So, but both of these options, man, I would say are awesome. You know, and then we'll hit on the seaweed extreme a little bit later. But, like, uh, in this case, uh, it says here, a crude fat all the way down at 5%. You know, and you should note. That's intentional probably because it's a seaweed product. It isn't, isn't made on fish meal predominantly. Uh, and uh, crude protein, 33%, which is way down from 50 But again, it's designed to be seaweed. It contains 67% seaweed. So, you know, kind of, I guess one thing doesn't, uh, if I have tangs and stuff, I want to consider, you know, the herbivorous fish that are in there and, and their needs. Mm -hmm. But, like, yeah, I mean, just you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Just look at what's in it and, uh, like, Forget what the packaging says. The only other thing I'll say about the packaging, though, actually, is this kind of like mylar type uh, bags and the ability to seal it closed. Yeah. The thing that's going to make them go bad is moisture and mm. contact with oxygen. Mm. So if you have a packaging that isn't a reasonable size, like it's not going to last me, you know, 16 years, and uh, <laughs> also, you know, isn't just some jar that like seals up with a little, you know, styrofoam cover or right. whatever, because uh, those plastic things, man, are, are horrible, horrible oxygen. Uh, uh, they transfer all kinds of oxygen and moisture as there's an imbalance. Uh, uh, foil line Marli bag like this one, man, uh, isn't going to allow oxygen or moisture through it to any great degree, especially because you can seal it properly. Cool. So, yeah, I don't know. That's what I'd look for in a uh, fish food, uh, a dry fish food if I was going to use one. And speaking of dry, uh, I think Douglas kind of hits it here too. Uh, well, maybe. Uh, there was somewhere in here. I forget who it was. Uh, but feeding rings are almost a necessity if mm. if you're automating for sure i would say like if you're going to get an automated fish feeder spend like 10 15 bucks or whatever it is for a feeding ring and yeah, regardless even yeah. without the auto feeder yeah i mean because yeah. uh, you could throw it yeah you I mean you could throw a handful in the tank and you can watch like uh 80 of it go down in the water column 20 percent go straight to the overflow and down so or, or the inverse or, or the, it could yeah. be yeah yeah so the little ring man it also i think it also makes it more palatable to the fish it allows it to soak up all the Soften water up, and whatnot mm -hmm. before it gets into the into the uh sinks into the tank so cool. uh so there's an interesting one uh which coral uh, corals benefit the most from direct feeding Okay, so, uh, you know, that's a good question. There's also another one right below that, so just pause there. From a feeding uh, response specifically, I mean, oh. LPS, uh, L you're just feeding response alone. Now, you can see at nighttime, you go and shine your flashlight on your LPS and some of these corals that have these, you know, these feeding tentacles or what have you that have open, that actually have a physical mouth. Uh, you see, you know, some Duncan corals or these, you know, you see uh, even anemones, you know, you can directly feed those too. I used to feed a, a sea bay anemone all the time and I I ended up ended up feeding it like full silver sides at one point in time, but I'm gonna tell uh, you why I was dumb. <laughs> I know you probably will. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, as far as like LPS specifically, you can see these things capture onto uh, particulate food and bring them towards the center, towards the mouth, and you see this feeding response, like acans and blastos, and you know, uh, like Duncans, and you know, 
trumpet corals, all these types of ones with feeding tendrils. You can see this stuff happen, and I'd say they're benefiting some way, shape, or form from that. If they're active, if there's an active feeding response. If they're sensing the availability of food yeah. and actively going after it, there is a high likelihood that they are going to capture some of it and find some benefit from it. Uh, it doesn't mean for sure in every case, but like that is definitely the ones. Then there's things like Acropora and stuff that, like you know, I would call you know in general. At uh, Acropora only has its polyps out at, at night, you know, and not in every case, but uh, because that's when the food comes out in the ocean. So in the tank, though, they are getting accustomed to the fact that there is actually food particles quite off uh, or frequently all the time. That's why you start to see. A, uh, a lot of the polyps out during different periods of day, and you can see even some of them like you know actively respond to the availability of certain foods and whatnot. Yeah. So they aren't like you know shooting out sweeper tentacles or you know like uh, you know grabbing food and pulling it in. And it's uh, arguable which size uh, micron food that an acropora is eating and whatnot. And it's hard to say because you don't actually see them grab stuff per se. Yeah. Uh, you know it's probably smaller than the you know human eye is going to see in that case. But definitely those types of foods. Mm. Uh, and oh yeah, I was going to actually talk about the, the the silver side thing. And this is my you know personal anecdotal uh, opinion because I used to feed silver sides to uh, bubble tipping enemies, and mm -hmm. it's super cool to watch. Yeah. Right? You, know, you watch them stick out their tentacle, they grab on the fish, and then they swallow the thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, most people don't know this, uh, but if you watch the thing closely at night, they often barf it back up. Yeah. Uh, and the reason by that is these organisms don't have like super advanced like Stomachs. digestive tracts yeah. and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you know it's not really used to catching a whole fish in the in the wild at that size, you know, and so it actually is more or less rotting inside of them as they're trying to break it down mm -hmm. and eventually it becomes toxic and they need to let it go. That makes sense. And so, yeah, my experience is feeding them the smallest food size possible and not an overwhelming amount is what's going to produce the best results with almost any coral or fish, man. Like, don't try to get it big, easy to feed pieces. It's not cool like working watch. out in the gym, you know, yeah. drinking protein. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and like, so, again, it's not like your digestive tract that a fish has. It's mm -hmm. a, you know, a very uncomplex thing. It's essentially rotting the food down. So uh, a fish that are foods that are already kind of closer to that state uh, are better and in not an overwhelming amount where it becomes toxic as there's all this ammonia is being built up or whatnot from the inside of it uh, or other byproducts. Uh, as someone here, I didn't read it quite yet, but Daniel W., uh, frozen over processed whole food over composites, natural over synthetic, dedication over complacent, attitudes in reef keeping uh, become stewards and not just passive uh, novelty aquarium keepers. Bravo, Daniel. Uh, really, man, like I, I just, you know, I think this is like one of those things, man, you got to remember, like you're a pet owner here. Yeah. You know, you, like you've taken on the responsibility to care for these organisms. It's not like, you know, just some fish you threw in there, they die, they die, who cares? You know, uh, I mean, like, I mean, I guess some people probably think about it that way, but I think that's like, I'd like to think about it more. I, I'd like to take care of these pets. A lot of these pets would live 20, 30 years in your, in your house if you let them, you know, take care of them proper. And so like, uh, I just want to make sure that I'm getting the proper nutrients to the, to the animal and taking care of it to the best of our ability. Uh, and best of your ability is a different thing, man. It's, it's money, it's time, mm -hmm. it's whatever. But don't put the least amount of effort in it. And as long as you're not dying, like, uh, feel like you did a good job. Because, yeah. you know, if it dies in three years, you might feel like you want to pat yourself on the back. I made it three years. But, like, that was a tenth of this organism's <laughs> lifespan, man. Like, uh, it died pretty damn early. So, you know, uh, I mean, I, I bravo to Daniel, man. Like, care about the things that you're doing here. And, and in this case, with fish food and stuff, man, it's, it's actually pretty cheap. Yeah. I mean, an expensive dry fish food here is last. 12 bucks. And you know what? Last. Like, two months worth? Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I guess I could shave three bucks off that or, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, like, you know, uh, you know, just, you know, caring a little bit, man, goes a long ways. Mm. Uh, all right. So, we're going to move on, man, to frozen foods. All right. So, frozen foods. Uh, what do you like about frozen foods? 
I used to use a, uh, there's a lot of variety. I mean, you go look at the like say you go look at our frozen food page and you see uh, algaes and you see brines and you see mysis and you see different types of mysis and you see spirulina and then you see colonis and you I mean there's just a, a wide variety of at specific food too. It's not like a list of ingredients. Like I know a brine shrimp is a brine shrimp and a squid. mysis shrimp is a mysis shrimp and squid is squid. Uh, and I know that. Some of those come from the natural ocean. Some of them are like freshwater being fed to saltwater fish. But uh, I, I like the, also like serving size. I know that a, it's easy for me to say two cubes. And if I'm leaving in a, or I've got somebody watching the tank and I go, hey, just throw two, two cubes in a cup and then dump, put it in the tank, I know my fish are fed for the day. Or you know, a couple of times a day, one cube here in the morning, one cube at night. So it's you know, measurable, easy, easy measurable too. So... But I used to take, like, uh, I was telling Ryan before we came in here, I used to take a concoction of all these different frozen squares and I'd push them all out into a bowl, melt them up or, you know, defrost them and then get some, uh, some algae wafer, some, nor some nori and throw nori in there, a little bit of silicon in there and then just kind of mix it up and then re-pour it into small, my own small cubes. I found like these little tiny ice cube trays. And then I had a mixture blend of everything, so I'm not free unthawing like a whole bunch of different types. And then I'd make my own mixed blend like that. But you're also going to have a point about that too. Well, I will. I think I'll hit that on that in the best ways in the to DIY. make some of your di yeah. DIY foods, man. But yeah, with frozen foods, like uh, you know, I like a couple of things, man. A, it is much closer to the you know animal's natural diet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like you know the exact thing this easy but it's seafood you know it's a uh, not a terrestrial animal it's not a terrestrial plant it's yeah. not brewer's yeast uh <laughs> you know it's not those things it's uh animals that came out of the sea so yeah. uh and i guess actually the most popular probably didn't come out of the sea so for those you don't know mysis shrimp is actually a freshwater shrimp mm -hmm. uh, and the reason that we feed it so commonly is because it has a really high nutritive content versus uh like brine shrimp or whatnot which generally has pretty low nutrient content uh, and so it is a way, way, way more commonly used thing. But outside of mysis shrimp, again, you're feeding like the squid. You're, you know, sometimes cuttlefish in there. You got, uh, you got uh, like uh, the. I guess brine shrimp is probably it's a, a big one. Fresh, freshwater shrimp too. Yeah, it? I think so. Yeah, uh, but there's like all kinds of different things. Uh, 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 foods that, you know, Hakari has like a whole slew of them. They also have you know tiny little foods like copepods and rotifers and yep. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that you know, really don't, you know, freeze dry as well. They're, when they're freeze dry, those little critters like that, it's kind of hard to get them to be rehydrated and they tend to float and go down the overflow. Uh, and so you really got to like, you know, shake the hell out of them to get them to rehydrate. Mm -hmm. So getting them frozen is actually a pretty big benefit in, in that specific case. Also, again, probably more palatable and, and at fish like antheas and stuff really, Small really, mouth, really yeah. like those tiny little plankton type foods. So a lot of people will buy clannis or, or, you know, uh, cyclopods or whatever mm -hmm. for, uh, they're, you know, corals or whatnot, but actually fish like antheus and chromis and stuff like that, like really seem to go after those things pretty strongly. Yeah. Uh, frozen foods, uh, also again, it, it, it's super hard to overfeed frozen foods uh, and it's easy to scale back if, you know, two were my problem, well, one, one I guess, yeah. right? You know? <laughs> True. Uh, you know, if three's my problem, do two. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's just more palatable. So finicky fish tend to like, you know, things that are natural to their diet. Presumably, you know, in some of these cases, probably more digestible than brewer's yeast, too. Mm -hmm. You know, their you know, digestive tracts have evolved around a very specific thing that you may not actually be feeding it, but let's get as close as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like... Our dogs were not eating, you know, puppy chow or no. whatnot and natural. Yeah, they were eating, you know, prey animals, yeah. right? Now, and so in this case, they're eating prey animals as well. So, you know, uh, they're also cheap. Most of these foods are, you know, really inexpensive. Uh, from yeah. The, yeah, mostly from the local fish store, too. I mean, you oh, might yeah. have to travel for some of them because it is perishable. Mm. Uh, you do have to, you know, I mean, you're either paying for shipping or you're going to your local fish store and getting it. But the good thing is, is like, you can get this stuff, a lot of this stuff in big flat packs and then yep. just keep it frozen. I mean, the stuff, it's not like, you know, if you have your dry food exposed to air where it might, you know, end up turning, uh, you know, 
becoming stale or something like that. You can just keep the stuff in the freezer. And as long as it's sealed and not, you don't get freezer burn and stuff like that, it lasts quite a long time. So I'll give you a few tips uh, uh, on this kind of stuff, man. I Go buy it at a fish store for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of the things that fish stores really thrive off of is, uh, you know, the consumable type of things like that that are easy to stock. So, man, support your fish store. Go down there and buy the fish food from them. That said, uh, I like to support fish stores that, uh, you know, take care of their clients as best as possible. You know, that when we had a fish store near here that, like, I wouldn't buy fish food from because I didn't want to give them money. Uh, it was it was so terrible in there. So even though it's super close, it just like it hurt me every time I thought about it. So like one of the things, man, is uh, the stuff needs to be maintained at a certain temperature. You know, mm-hmm. otherwise it loses all of its nutritional qualities, gets freezer burnt. Mm-hmm. So if you walk up to the freezer and it's just filled with uh, ice. Uh, ice and yeah. freezer burn and stuff. Close the door and go buy somewhere else uh, because it's not being care- taken care of. It's just like you wouldn't buy a, a chicken that looked like that for your family, uh, man, or yeah. even your dog. So, like, that's just not a good place to buy it. Uh, I, I also wouldn't buy it from, like, an online shop that is shipping it to you in three days. You know, the, the dry ice may last that long. If it comes thawed, don't buy again. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to tell you, like, throw it away or anything like that, but, like, don't buy from that place again. If it, if it arrives on your doorstep thawed, uh and like hopefully that never happens here. But uh, here I, I can tell you like, uh, you know, fish food isn't really our thing. I think probably we lose money with every shipment that leaves here. So please don't buy it from me. <laughs> uh, but if you do, uh, you know, uh, we try to make it's it available. Overnight. Cause yeah. like, what do you need for a fish tank? You need, you know, number one, I need probably salt. Two, I need uh, uh, fish food. Uh, both those things are total losers here. Uh, <laughs> shipping heavy buckets of salt is, is not cheap, uh, especially free. But the fish food, man, like here, you know, we have a, a freezer that is like, I don't know, man, sub-zero. You yeah. know, like it, it is super, super cold because they dictated to us exactly what the temperature is, uh, uh, Hakari did, that the stuff needs to be maintained at to have the longest shelf life. Mm-hmm. It's a walking cooler so that, you know, it's frozen all the time. Like opening it up doesn't let all the cold air out all of a sudden. Yeah. Uh, it's capable of rapidly getting back to that temperature so it's not thawing and creating all that, you know, frost and whatnot. And then we ship it overnight with, uh, uh, I believe it's carbon or, uh, CO, or dry ice pellets yeah. uh, that fill up all the space in there. So buy it from your fish store first because that's the best place to do it. A, it's probably, you know, you'll, you know what you're getting because you can look at it uh, and make sure that they're taking care of it in that environment. Two, uh, if I was going to buy it online, uh, frankly, I'd buy it from us, man, because, uh, like, I know here we're taking care of it proper. Uh, maybe someday I'll give you like a little tour. I'll show you the cooler, oh, yeah. but uh, and you know what's in it. But yeah, I, I make sure you're buying. If you're gonna buy a fresh food, it's not fresh unless it's taken care of. So uh, anything else about frozen food food that you like? That I like? Uh, I think I pretty much hit it. The variety is probably the biggest thing. Is I I can make my own or like for the 160, it's uh, you know like two or three cubes of mysis, one or two cubes of brine for a different size, and then Kalanis, and uh, I used to do Mega Marine type of Hikari stuff in here too, but just really mix it up. Uh, it's a big, I melt, you melt it all in a big cup and then just squeeze it in as you go. You can almost leave it there in one, and that kind of kind of leads to like DIY fish food, like uh, making your own, but choosing that. But we'll do that just as far as I don't like about frozen fish food is it's a lot of work. I was like, I gotta, I have a cup, so I'll get you know some tank water, and then I'll go to the freezer, and I'll put some f- cubes in a cup, and then I'll walk away because I know it's got to defrost, and then I go to like a baseball game or get called up mm. to go meet some buddies, and then come back and go to bed, and the thing's still sitting on the counter. Wake up in the morning, and I forgot to feed the fish, and now it's this nasty sludgy mess. Just wasted some cubes, and uh, it's easy for me to get distracted. Same thing with RO, making RODI water and putting it all over my floor. I walk away. Uh, so that's one of the uh, one of the things. It's like you do have to spend some time like thinking about it. I'm gonna do this here, and then I'm gonna go do something. I'm gonna come back, and I gotta feed my fish. So I gotta tell you, uh, there's been more than one time where I'm sitting in my office, like, man, something stinks in here. <laughs> and sure enough, man, there's a cup of food that's been yeah. sitting there from Friday on Monday that uh, I forgot to feed the fish. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just more work. You can't automate it. It's not at the tank, you know, in most cases. I'll just say, though, man, I think that if you don't got five minutes to spend with your tank every day, uh, like, why do you have it? 
Like, uh, I mean, like, why I have this thing? And so the process of, you know, mixing up the food and bringing it there and kind of, like, you know, interacting with your fish. Because this is how we interact with the fish is feeding them. Just feeding you know, them. That's, uh, hell, yeah. that, that's the one way that they <laughs> like you and you like them. You know? <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, so, I mean, make the five minutes, yeah. you know, to, to be honest, and, unless you can't. Uh, and if you want to feed more often, so I'd, I'd say, man, feed some frozen food in the morning if you can't. In the evening, man, I have a little auto feeder that dumps some pellets in there for whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, uh, other things I don't like about frozen food, you know, you know, to be honest, man, is like in many cases I don't know, you know, how well the stuff is taken care of, you know, or the average person doesn't. And, you know, I don't know if they've got any, like, funky additives in, in any of it and, you know, some of it's more palatable than others, and some of it is freshwater food and not, you know, seawater food. Oh, wait, this brings up a good point. This kind of brings up a good question, like, and it's heavily debated on the forums, too. Rinse your frozen food mm. or not rinse your frozen food? There's people that die by, live and die by taking a bunch of frozen food, running it through some, either like a fishnet or a filter sock or something, and then cleaning it all out because supposedly supposedly all that water has a bunch of phosphates, nitrates, and stuff in it. Well, I'll tell you what, man. Like, it kind of depends on, like, what year you're asking. Is it 2005, 2010, or 2018? 19 almost. Uh, And you know what? It's just like, oh, man, nutrients are such a problem. Oh, man, I don't got enough nutrients. Oh, man, like, well, there's a certain number. You know, like, uh, like, where, where are we at? And so I think in today's environment is, uh, you know, like, you know, early in a tank, pretty low nutrients. As uh, the thing is uh, becoming robust and has a biological uptake from corals and whatnot, you know, you let the nutrients rise a little bit, maybe even beneficial, uh, but, you know, not too high. And then, like, what I've seen is the people that have tested the amount of nutrients that the, the rinse adds, it's, like, minuscule in relation to the actual food. And, yeah, yeah like, it just ain't worth the effort to me. Uh, in fact, like, I need to add more food in most cases. So, like, uh, in, in the robust tank. Yeah. So, in a new tank, no, I just, I would never do that. Probably uh, I just I would it. never rinse the food. It, I, everything I've ever read is, is, I've never tested that one myself. Maybe we'll do investigates on it. But is it doesn't add enough nutrients to, to like to weigh out against against the actual food it's irrelevant so yeah that's good cool. all right uh so uh which frozen foods would you use man uh yourself uh i like the i like what we feed the 160 and, and i actually also use it on my own tanks too so uh like it's a mixture of different types of cubes for, uh thawed out together so it, like i said it was the PE, the Piscine, the Piscine, 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 Piscine Energetics, uh, uh, Mysis, uh, the Spirulina Brine, the PE, again, Colonis. Um, and maybe, I mean, you can get rotifers in there. I think every once in a while I'd throw a little. And then the rotifer cubes from Hakari are like half cubes. They're really not full size cubes. Yeah, throw one of those in there too, maybe. Uh, but that's probably, that's, that's basically it. There's a Mega Marine from uh, Hakari that has big um it's like almost like it almost looks like fish poo in the shape it's like a cone shape but it's like Mm. algae uh and you can see these large chunks of like algae floating around too so all right so i'll tell two two things in here uh number one i generally feed uh the uh mysis it's just what i've done over all the years and it never seems to have been a problem Mm -hmm. and then if i have small fish or i'm feeding trying to feed corals i also mix either those uh, cyclopods or calanus in Mm -hmm. there those tiny little guys uh, often both uh and uh i've been known to spray it into the sand and stuff for sand sifters and and whatnot Mm -hmm. but also leading into uh uh some diy foods here is uh rod's food man so oh, yeah. rod man uh did we print that thing out yeah so yeah. I, I don't want to bring it out because it's frozen man but uh so rod's food is kind of like a diy food but somebody diy for you already yeah. so you don't have to mess up your wife's blender <laughs> or your husband's blender i guess but you know your spouse's blender doesn't have to get filled with fish yeah uh, or, or a food <laughs> processor or whatnot Especially and, I'm making shakes the next morning. So in the nature of, you know, hearing what's in this stuff, man, and deciding whether or not my fish wants to eat this, uh, uh, again, the moisture content, 81%. Uh, protein, only 10%. So one-fifth as much protein as your, as your uh, uh, dried foods. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fat, 2.9%. So one-fifth there as well. 
So it would take five times as much, man, by weight uh, to uh, feed the same amount of nutrition. Uh, but, you know, it has water in it. It's more palatable. It's much similar. And that's because the ingredients in this food is whole shrimp, whole squid, whole oyster, whole clam, whole octopus, perch, scallop, krill, Pacific plankton, brine shrimp, fish eggs, uh, green seaweed, raw seaweed, broccoli, carrot, mini pellets, brine shrimp, rotta furs, beta carotene, garlic, and omega-3 fatty acids. That sounds like a fish. Yeah, I mean, other than broccoli, yeah. I guess. You know, and carrots. But a smorgasbord. Yeah, I mean, this is all <laughs> stuff that is absolutely in, you know, this fish's natural, not natural diet, I should say, but all sea, seafood creatures. And, you know, is like a whole slew of things without me having to go buy, like, Every, you know, all of those yeah. things and mix them together. Sure. You know, and, you know, the nature of this thing is it's definitely made for, you know, a variety of fish. So, like... Your, your fish might not eat the whole thing. Like, you often see little pieces of krill and stuff in there. Yeah. And, you know, I guess, you know, the tanks probably here would tear apart those krill. But, like, you know, sometimes it might be too big for some of your fish, and it'll just settle out like any other food. But it's a wider array of food all in one. So, you know, this is kind of like a do-it-yourself fish food for people. But, you know, like, took it to the next level. And for those of you who don't know, reef chili was actually that. So uh, reef chili originally was the first thing we ever made here. It was a uh, frozen food that I made for my own fish, uh, and I quickly realized that I made like you know several decades worth. And sold it <laughs> to the local club. They all ate it up, and it just kind of grew from there. Oh. Eventually, I didn't like shipping frozen product out of my house, so I stopped doing that. But uh, you know, you know it. Making that do-it-yourself fish food is real rewarding. You get to see what goes into it. It's an extension of the hobby. It's super fun. And so I just thought we'd talk about, about that a, a little bit, you know. And uh, I think Rod's food came out, like, almost the same time as the oh, frozen yeah. reef chili. I, I'd love to bring the frozen reef chili back again, huh. you know, honestly. We but played around with it one day. Yeah, yeah we service. did, man. And it was so stinky in <laughs> here that, like, it just wasn't for the current environment. But... Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think we'll probably shoot do, shoot some videos, man, actually, how to make this stuff for yourself at, at home, you yeah. know, and then you, don't, you can just buy it yourself. Uh, but, uh, all right, so, like, what do you like about uh, do-it-yourself food, man? Uh, well, I, we got to go to the grocery store together or in the, in the markets together, in the seafood markets, and uh, you want shrimp? There they are. You want uh, you, you want clams? There they are. You want this? You want that? You, you know, different types of fish. You get to really pick out your own. Um, so then you, it's the same, same thing as rods, but you know, the work's already done for you. But maybe you don't like a few things in there. Maybe you like different particle sizes than what uh, is in the pre-mixed blended stuff. Well, I can change the particle size myself. I just chop it up more. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's probably the you know that's probably my favorite thing about it is I can visually pick out off of the shelf. And then I can make it, you know, cater to my size, my fish. So, yeah, absolutely. So, like, if you're gonna go shop for stuff that you're gonna put in your uh, food, there's a couple of different things, man. I would look for in a do-it-yourself fish food. Uh, I tend to try to pick fish that are lower on the uh, like uh, hierarchy of uh, the food chain. Mm -hmm because they tend to have like lower like heavy metals in them like mercury and stuff uh so you know things like shrimp i think cod has uh, low metals like that in it uh you know squid uh you know cuttlefish uh, fish eggs and stuff and so like one of my favorites to, to mix in there is actually i'm gonna butcher the name like tabuku or something taboco or i don't know but it's those little uh, orange guys they go oh, yeah. on the top of your uh, sushi so uh, and related to that, the Asian market is absolutely one of the best places to buy all this stuff because they have all kinds right. of frozen seafood that you just wouldn't find at your local grocery store. Uh, and the only thing I'll, I'll say about the the fish eggs, like fish absolutely love those little orange guys. And I'm going to butcher it again. Like, I don't even know how to say this. I, I've just seen it before. You know, there's two types of them. They all look orange and whatnot. Uh, but there's, like, uh, the flying fish row, which is, starts with the T. And then there's, like, Masago or something like that, which uh, it actually doesn't have that orange color to begin with and looks real similar, but it's been dyed orange. So huh. I just would, you know, probably not use that one. Uh, it's, like, smelt row or something like oh, okay. that. Uh, it's usually, like, a you know, natural dye, like, you know, out of some kind of other animal, but, like, I still wouldn't probably use that. Uh, so uh, the little fish eggs, man, are one of my favorite things to put in there. 
Uh, I really like using, uh, like, uh, we've used scallops a lot in the past. Uh, I used to shuck oysters and stuff, but that's just, like, such a pain in the butt, man. Especially if you're not eating them. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, I I just don't, I wouldn't go through it. I don't think there's enough nutrient, uh, you know, benefit to to do that kind of thing, man, to put that much effort into shucking oysters and whatnot and clams and whatnot. Uh, I know when the do-it-yourself fish food that they make down at, at uh, WWC. WWC is predominantly tilapia. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like tilapia. I, I haven't asked them why they use tilapia, but this is my guess. It's probably super low-cost protein. Yeah. Right? It's just like protein we're adding to the tank. And, uh, you know, that's a freshwater fish. But mm-hmm. uh, if anybody's seen how healthy all their fish is, yeah. uh, freshwater, salt, whatever, you know, it, they're producing results with that tilapia and mm. chopping it up in the in the blender. It's kind of like turn, they turn it into like a paste almost. Yeah, almost. And stick it on the glass. You can stick it, yeah. So in relation to that, man, use whatever fish you want. Uh, I also go to Costco, uh, and, uh, you know, they have a, like a seaweed medley at Costco that you can buy. Uh, they have all kinds of frozen fish or fresh fish. Uh, and in that spirit, man, there's a lot of ways to cut this stuff up. Yeah, I know. It was, was good to hit on that. We, so we, uh, we, were trying to talk, we were talking about particle size, and I think when we were talking to the customer service about building this fish food, we took one of our Fridays and did this fish food uh, bazaar here in the, in, the, in the cafeteria. It stunk like, uh, like crazy. But, um, so we, got, we ended up getting you know, just paring knives. It was clams that just stuck It was probably. Yeah. Uh, we got paring knives. We got uh, shredders. We got you know, food processors. There was a, a whole slew of different types of ways to cut this stuff up, and we were, uh, I think one was the the, uh, the garlic mincer or something like that. Uh, I mean, there was a couple different options that we had to try to, you know, there's each of these frozen foods, the fiber of the, of the, of the meat or the fiber, the, if, you know, after it's frozen is different. Some of it, you know, shred, uh, you shred it, and then it just disintegrates into the water. Some of it you shred on the same type of shredder, and it actually holds its form. I think uh, like a flaky fish like tilapia, man, it just falls just apart, falls, yeah. whereas like tuna doesn't. Yeah, right? yeah it holds uh, together. It holds together totally different. So yeah. it's something we played around with was trying to figure out, like, what's the best way to chop all this up in like a, you know, in, a, in sort of a fast, uh, faster manner. I mean, you could just... Essentially, if you're doing it at home, if I was going to do it at home, I'd for, probably forego a lot of those different uh, tools and stuff and just get a knife and chop it up and mince it up while it's frozen. Uh, but we played with that, too. So, uh, so I'll just throw a couple of pieces of advice. If you want to do this at home, man, it's super fun. It's totally worth doing yeah. once. Uh, you <laughs> know, fun. like go out and go buy some of this stuff and do it one time, man, because it's, it's like a really cool extension of the hobby. Yeah. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can get some like links and stuff to some you know, common like recipes or whatnot, but really, I mean, you can't mess this up, man. Go buy some fish, yeah, like especially in a single use. But this is a couple of ways that I found to uh, you know, get it ready for use. If you get fresh, uh, you can chop it up with a knife, man. You can put it in a blender. You can put it in a food processor. Uh, I find that it very often in a food processor or blender, man, will just turn to mush, man. Yeah. You're gonna have like fish pudding. You know, uh, and you know maybe that's what you're Corals, looking for. Yeah. You can kind of like just smush it under the glass, and they'll kind of eat the fish pudding off of there. But I, I'm usually looking for some kind of particles, uh-huh. and so uh, one there's a few different ways, man. I try to do it. Well, I'll just say first up, if you're going to do it fresh, one of the cool things that I, I've done in the past, like uh, for myself uh, making hamburgers, is get a big old cleaver. Like just go buy one. It's big, heavy guy. And I take steak, man. I just cut it up into strips and then cut it up into strips and then just cube it and just turn it, chop it until it forms into uh, uh, like a particle size that looks like your hamburger. Yeah. And for me, it's delicious because it has all this air in there and it, it just makes a super, super juicy burger. But outside of that for your, uh, for your home, <laughs> uh, man, you can just kind of chop it up until it looks like the particles that you want to feed to your fish, yeah. man. And so really easy that way. Uh, and the weight of the cleaver kind of like does all the work for you instead of like trying to like, you know, slice and dice it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like that would be the way I'd probably do it if I was going to do it raw. But frozen, man, there's actually a lot of cool things you can do with it. Uh, one of the things we did uh, was, uh, you know, like you see the little that, Parmesan graters yeah, they give you. That over was a, perfect. Yeah, you get it like at, what do you call it? Uh, uh, what's Bed, that? Bath. Uh, no, I'm talking about the place you go to eat pasta. Uh, uh, never-ending breadsticks place. Oh, uh, uh 
Olive Garden. Olive Garden, yeah. <laughs> yeah they like some Parmesan, sir. Uh, yeah, and one so of those. You throw a scallop in there, man, and you it's spin true. this thing, and it just shoots it's out perfect. these little stringy things, the scallop, man, right? Yeah. Uh, and you got to kind of, like, pay attention to, like, you're going with or against the grain and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But, like, it, it will do that with other types of food, too, man. And then you can kind of just put it in water and decide if that's, the, like, you know, consistent you're looking for. But, you know, something as small as an anthea, it breaks up into little pieces, and it might be actually ideal for, for that application. Also, I really like using the uh, grater the attachments grater. on a, yeah. yeah, on a, like you can actually use a cheese grater, but, yeah. you know, beware your knuckles. <laughs> uh, but like a, a, the cheese grater attachment on a food processor. And so that day we did the food or the DIY fish food here as a team, I went and bought one. Man, it was 30 bucks yeah. at Target. You know, just like buy the cheapest, you know, food processor out there. Don't use your spouse's because uh, they'll <laughs> hate you forever. It really will stink like it does. fish forever. So, you know, you have a tool for this purpose, and it has a little cheese gator attachment, and you can just, like, shoot your 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 fish through it, and it will shoot it out into little chunks. And you want to make it small chunks, take that through mash it and screw it through it again, <laughs> and it will make half the chunks. True. Uh, and so I find the cheese grater thing. You could try a slicer or maybe attachment. You can also use just the, you know, blend or the food grater. I don't like the blender for this at all, by the way. But the, uh, like, the blender attachment on a food processor Mm -hmm. will, you know, do it. Very often, it will be more mushy than not. You know, if you use that thing, it's pretty hard to get it to pulse into the perfect blend. But, like, you know, try to think about ways of the tool. Like, what do I want it to look like in the end? You know, if I have this block of fish, man, like, I can chop it up. I can, you know, blend it up. I can grate it. I can do whatever I want. But I really liked using the grater. Hopefully, we'll do a, a BRS Investigates at some point, man. We'll kind of, like, show you what it looks like, you know, in its original form. And then we'll show you after we'll rinse it off. And you can see how, how big the particles are and, you know, you know, not have to waste all the food at your house, mm-hmm. you know. Hey. And uh, I'm trying to think of what else, man. Oh, uh, there's some things I don't do personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't add, uh, uh, and this gets to your mixing all those fish foods together. I do not go buy uh, like frozen chopped up foods, like uh, prepared foods for aquarium use, and then thaw them and mix them all together. Specifically, I don't do it with or with uh, mice shrimp personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they will even tell you this. So over at Piscine is that. Like they, you know, I think they freeze them like right there in the boat, Smash man. Frozen. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, but like, they're a real fragile creature, and so when you thaw them and refreeze them, even if you just thawed it and refroze it, you broke the cellular structure of that animal. It falls apart, you know, in your tank much easier. But if you thaw it and like actually try to mix it with something, oh, yeah. uh, it just completely det- 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 just deteriorates, and so. That might be beneficial if you're making like some kind of like coral gumbo oh, or whatnot, food, you know, yeah. like uh, trying to like feed the whole tank of uh, broken up, you know, uh, fatty acids and whatnot. Well, that may work just fine. But be aware when you thaw those foods, you know, something like a squid will probably hold its form pretty good because it's pretty tough meat. Mm-hmm. But like something like a, a brine shrimp or a, a mysis is just going to completely deteriorate as you're mixing it around in there. <laughs> uh, and you just... You may want that, but if you don't, know that that's what's going to happen for sure. So in my case, man, like say I wanted to feed mysis and I wanted to feed the other stuff, I just get some mysis and some cubes, uh, feed my own mix, and throw some my, uh, mysis cube in there with it. Uh, there's no reason it has to be mixed in with yeah, it, right? That's true. Uh, I also note uh, on your do-it-yourself fish foods that there's all kinds of different things that you could add in there. You can add spirulina. You can add some kind of like brine shrimp foods in there you can add like a selco or selcon mm-hmm. which is like a multiplied like fatty acids uh, like uh, you know fish oils and stuff in there you can add all kinds of things that boost the nutrition of value you can uh, add like a seaweed uh, uh, flakes oh, nor- nori, uh, nori sheets, sheets yeah. uh, and nori sheets that's what I uh, that's what I really liked about nori sheets is I wouldn't I wouldn't clip them on anymore because I what I found is if I if I took a nori sheet and wetted it down and folded it into force, I mean, you get a nice nori sheet like this, you can fold it into force, and then soak that in the, in the water. Uh, if you come back to it and you just kind of shake it and rub, you know, kind of rub it together, in the, it, it'll turn into just bite-sized flakes. It's really cool. And then I, when I dose it, I can see these bite-sized flakes of nori going in there, and the, all my tangs were just eating on it, gnawing on it, you know, versus 
a big sheet of nori in there. I think we'll get to also, but uh, versus like clipping a big sheet of nori on there and they tear it apart and big chunks go flying behind the rock work that never gets eaten by them. That maybe your inverts eat or something like that. Your hands go uh, in the tank every day. Oh, yeah. that it's on your hand. Well, and then you forget. Same thing with forgetting to feed the fish, forgetting to pull the clip out. And when you finally pull the clip out, you unclip it and all that's decomposing of the of the nori sheet and stuff and it's really nasty but so in relation to that people will often uh put like uh, a lot of pellets and stuff in their do-it-yourself fish food and one of the cool things about that like the seaweed extreme man it's you know 67 percent you know seaweed so you can mix that in there instead of the nori and they'll probably eat the pellets one of the cool things about you know dried pellet foods in this case is they're going to soak up whatever's around it. So mm-hmm. you know uh, they're going to soak up the uh, fish oils and, and whatnot. They're all going to be healthy and beneficial. And so when they eat the pellet, it's now healthier. Especially if you use like Selco or Selcon or anything like that, uh, and add additional oils to it. And the same thing you you know you say you mix the, the uh, nori sheets with. Uh, like a uh, water mm-hmm. you could also you know just put selcon on it just whatever it soaks up will make it you know moist and then tear it up again so you can mm-hmm. you can make all this stuff even more nutritive uh and uh you know super cool mm-hmm. so i think that kind of sums up uh at least our first take on fish food this is one of those things i'd like to like expand on and uh, do some brs tv investigates on and yeah. you know help people like you know make this stuff at home because it's super fun uh and ultimately uh, like it's it's pretty cheap too. Uh, uh, one of the things, uh, like all those foods and stuff that people you know buy, uh, like uh, you know you have buy all these different particulate foods and whatever. Uh, one of the things I recommend is actually just this little guy of uh, reef chili. Instead of having to buy a container this big of 15 different items uh, and dump it in there, and then you only you know you use a tablespoon of each one or a teaspoon even, and like you have a billion years worth. You know, this guy here has zooplankton, spray-dried phytoplankton, rotifers, copepods, uh, uh, brine shrimp replacement diet, and a variety of different microns, uh, daphnia, spirulina powder. Uh, it contains uh, uh, vitamin and mineral premixes. Uh, all kinds of different things in it's here, chilly. man. Like all in one, and so you can just mix it in with your fish food. It's going to feed your corals. It's also going to increase the nutritive value of a lot of the foods, man. They get stuck on it. So, you know, instead of adding specifically, you're not just making fish food, but you're making a fish and coral food. This is like I think this guy's like twelve ninety nine, man. So like for twelve ninety nine, I have a solution that probably replaces you know two three hundred bucks worth of like little containers yeah. that like I would never use in a lifetime. Well, not only that, we packed that we packed that reef chili so thick that that little jar for I, I, I used a little jar like that for my ninety three gallon cube, and I swear the thing lasted like months and months i mean i'm doing like two scoops so two little scoops of it here and there and it takes forever to get through that jar so. I, and most of you probably <laughs> heard this a thousand times but uh you know uh, i like to use things that have proven results and uh, reef roids and reef chili yeah. are the only two that i'm aware of that any you know you know professional uh, uh scientific proof yeah, yeah so like Laboratory university of, of, of hawaii did a study on coral like uh, growth in flow mm-hmm. uh nutrition and uh, I think lighting as well. And reef chili and reef roids were the only ones that actually Produced grew the coral growth, faster, yeah. and one of them was really significant, like 80% faster or yeah. something like that. So, uh, yeah, so I like to use things that have proven value, and especially if it's cheap. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, <laughs> no, awesome. All right, so we'll move on, man. Let's answer a couple questions here. Yeah, uh, sure. All right. Uh, would you say that the reason many products exist to mop up and cleanse a tank are due to inefficient feeding, as there are understanding and information regarding efficient feeding? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, man, I would say that, like, I don't like all the – if I don't have to, man, I don't want to use all the products to, like, try to – I don't want a carbon dose, and I don't want to uh, – uh, like use all kinds of phosphate removers yeah. and all that stuff, man. Mm-hmm. I'd rather find a you know balance to the nutritive input and my export methods, yeah. right? Uh, and like you know anything you put in the tank is going to have unintended consequences. So like you know GFO has been used for decades now, like it's super proven to prove a pull out uh, uh, phosphate and support a healthy reef tank. But like. Uh, 
it absolutely has to be adding something else to the tank at, at the same time. It's not like super perfect at only phosphate, right? Yeah. It's probably pulling something else out too, you know? And so like I'd avoid it if I didn't have to, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, man, a lot of the, you know, magic elixirs and solutions and stuff out there are, you know, in response to just not figuring out the right input to export. And, you know, like there's really simple methods to export now, like, you know, refugiums and algae Simples. scrubbers and oh, stuff yeah. like that. And then I, I'm starting to think about a refugium and an algae scrubber as like, uh, you know, kind of like a, you know, one phase crutch, you know, like the getting from year one to year three or two or three is more difficult from getting three to 10, yeah. you know, in many ways, uh, you know, because like there's all these things that are happening in a brand new tank that all these battles that are happening and, and the corals aren't uptaking the nutrients as fast. Once you have a tank that's just like riddled with coral, the amount of food you put in it is like, a, a, yeah, yeah, it's irrelevant almost, man. Yeah. It's like really easy to maintain and like, you know, your biggest export of nutrients is actually Corals. coral growth, yeah. you know? Uh, so, like, uh, it's, it's less of an issue. So, uh, like, maybe you don't need your refugium as much after year three or even take it offline or, you know, slowly ratchet the uh, time that's on down. But, yeah, find a balance in there. So uh, let's answer a couple other questions. Man, it's already 106. Uh, all right. Uh, do you recommend adding vitamins to DIY food, and how would you do it? Yeah, well, why why not, man? I mean, again, as long as it's like, I, who knows what vitamin is like, you know, absolutely required, and like, I wouldn't like overdo it or anything. But you know, there's lots of vitamins out there for this specific purpose. Like, yeah, I think Cellcon says like mm -hmm. only five drops or like ten drops per pretty small amount. It's mm -hmm. a fairly small amount, so. I mean, that's how concentrated some of that stuff is. So you could easily overdo it, I imagine. So there's, yeah, natural diet food, like vitamins and stuff like that probably come from, like, natural fats like that. But there's also things, uh, I know, like, uh, Brightwell has a series of little vials that you can, mm. you know, dose directly to the food. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't do it, like, all controlled, like, more is better, man. But, like, uh, you know, definitely adding some of that kind of thing uh, probably won't hurt uh, all right. All right. Justin asked if we rinse our mice. So we covered that one a little earlier that uh, it's negligible, probably, the difference between rinsing and non rinsing. I've never rinsed it in my whole life, man. <laughs> I, and I, actually, I probably did it twice or something. Like, this is a waste of time. I, I don't think that it's removing. Uh, if you look at the amount that of uh, nutrients that are in the shrimp itself versus the amount of water, it's an irrelevant equation. Expiration uh, date on DIY food. Expiration. Uh, I would say, you know, I guess Definitely. I. It's quality or freezer, man. Yeah. You know, so like, uh, uh, I would try to keep it in a chest freezer. And the reason, the biggest reason for a chest freezer is because when you open it, the cold S air stays inside mm -hmm. the chest freezer, and so yeah. everything stays cold. True. Uh, if I have a freezer that's meant for like groceries and stuff that opens like this. All the cold air immediately rushes out the bottom, and all of a sudden, you know, instead of being, you know, 20 degrees or whatever it is in your freezer, I mean, oh, maybe it's zero. I don't, who knows whatever it is. But it goes all the way up to room temperature almost, and then it's going to take hours to get back up. And that process of going up and down destroys the quality of the food that's in there called mm -hmm. freezer burn. So, yeah, tre chest freezer uh, in that case. But if it looks freezer bur burn, throw it out, man. It's done. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would say that, you know, if you take care of it proper, uh, you know, probably up to a year, you know, uh, at, at that point it probably wouldn't go any farther than that. But. Mm. All right. Uh, I'm using Reef Nutrition refrigerator foods. Is there any benefit to this over frozen, or is frozen food considerably better? Uh Refrigerated, refrigerated food. food. Oh, those, oh, little, those like, little bottles, like Oyster Feast and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I think that's what you're talking about. I'd say I don't know. I'm not real familiar with the refrigerated food, uh, mm -hmm. to be honest. But a lot of those things, uh, you know, they have preservatives in them, but they're more palatable. I, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to comment on it because I, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to research their, you know, version of refrigerated mm -hmm. food and, and what you know the claim benefits are. I wouldn't say they're probably overly dramatic. Uh, you know. I guess, I mean, we all know what a, a frozen steak tastes like versus a fresh one, or a you know frozen piece of fish versus a, a fro or a fresh one. Uh, but from nutritive quality, I don't I don't think the nutrition value is going to go way down uh, freezing it. All right, is garlic soaking still a thing? 
I, I, to my knowledge, man, the garlic has zero value in the things that it says it does, which is like you know prevents ick or something, or it helps you know you create uh, create a, a desire for feeding, a feeding response. So I've heard it may, maybe any flavoring can create a re, free. A re, it works in bass fishing, doesn't it? I guess, uh, secret uh, sauce. Secret sauce. <laughs> and, uh, I've actually read studies where the garlic actually like hurts its internal organs. You know, like mm. so, like bad idea. I think it's one of those like myths out there that uh, I'm not going to go ahead and say like you're a bad person if you're feeding garlic or something like that because you just believe something different than I, I believe yeah. or read you know different study or whatnot. But everything I've read about garlic other than maybe as a flavor enhancement to fish that won't eat, which is worth a shot. If your That's fish isn't eating, man, whatever you can that. do to get it to eat yeah. uh, is a good move. But uh, if it is eating, I, I wouldn't bother with that. And I think more of a marketing thing and a way to try to sell product. And then uh, can you completely disprove that it cures ick? Uh, I don't think there's anything <laughs> out there, man, that if, if they said that it did that, I wouldn't use it. Yeah. Like I just, I just think if it says it cures ick on there, they are lying to you, and you should not <laughs> trust these people. Uh, that is as far as I go. There you go. Uh, you know, I would almost go as far as if they're including it in there, man. Is like, well, hey, let's just throw the kitchen sink in too. Oh uh, yeah, it's not like on my list, especially to read the study about how it actually hurts her organs. I just, I would, I would instinctively not use a fish, the a food that had garlic in it. Huh. So uh, that's as far as I go. Question, Nick. Okay, what are your thoughts on natural seaweed found in Asian markets versus the frozen seaweed in uh, stores? Oh. Uh, so, I don't know about natural, man. Like, I've never used that actual, like, natural, like, non-dried seaweed before. No, uh, oh, you actual plant soft yeah. material. Yeah. I, I guess I wouldn't. I wouldn't just feel like you could use any of it because who knows? Like different plants kind of take up different nutrients that you may not want in your tank. Well, right? then you're talking like preserve. Like if you think about the vegetables in your gar in your grocer's shelves and how long a vegetable can stay and why it does that is because of the things that they put on it. Whether it's you know whether it's pesticides, insecticides. You know I don't know if the same exists for seaweed, but. Uh, or long, you know, preservatives and stuff like that. Maybe that might be in maybe. there too. Yeah. So in that spirit, man, a lot of people use nori out of the, out of the Asian store oh, or, even, or anywhere. Tons yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't have any problem with that one. Uh, you know, dried sheets. Uh, I, I would look at it though. Uh, make sure it doesn't have any weird preservatives yeah. in it. Uh, some of it's oiled and some of it's salted and some of it's and flavored no, no flavor and means, stuff man. like that. Yeah. You know, just straight. You know, nori sheet dry. I mean, in, in all honesty, I, I haven't done that in ages because. Uh, have it here you know but like it i i don't know i wouldn't have any problem with that i, I would do a little bit of research to make sure there's no preservatives flavoring salt yeah. all that kind of weird no taco mm. sauce on it you know anything like that uh no what? teriyaki flavor <laughs> yeah. uh, what's uh what's reef chili's shelf life uh, i would i would probably la uh, throw it out after a year as well you know I mean, it's a it's a you know preserved you know, like dehydrated, you know, uh, preserved product. Mm. So it'll last a long time and in then there. But at, and then after mixed, probably use right away. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. if you mix it in a in the liquid, man, like use it today. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep it. It's going to start to break down. There's you know? plenty in there that you can keep it. Yeah, you, you can use it and then be done with it. I uh, saw so the same thing. Like if you mix it in with your fresh or uh, your DIY fish food, uh, same kind of period of time, frozen. That yeah. wouldn't really work. Uh, what's in Cellcon? So I don't know the exact thing, but I'm pretty certain that Cellcon is just a uh, diluted Cellco. So uh, there's stuff called like Super Cellco, and it's like a, uh, a type of thing that you would normally feed, uh, you know, brine shimp hatcheries to make them, you know, uptake a whole bunch of uh, nutrition slightly before preserving them. So they're like kind of like gut loaded or whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I'm pretty certain that it's just you know emulsified like fish proteins or lipids or whatever mm. or not fats i shouldn't say not proteins uh lipids or fats and uh it is designed to provide healthy energy to the what about uh, so we haven't really hit on coral foods specifically coral foods too much so also ryan and i were talking in the office before we came in here about uh things like you know things like broadcast food liquid liquid type coral foods versus par particulate type coral foods so Probably consider this coral food, and some smaller fish mm -hmm. eat it too. 
Uh, Predominantly, but, that would be coral food. Coral food, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I keep I see a couple people here. I used to use, uh, I used to use, and I think uh, a couple of guys still here in the office use that uh, Reef Energy A and B by uh, Red Sea. And uh, I was telling Ryan, uh, the one thing about this is uh, you, there's acro towers, there's, you know, the, was it, KZ's got a bunch of different types of coral foods that you can drop into the tank. I and mean, there's a whole slew of them out there. Uh, I personally liked uh, Red Sea for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's got this really cool phos- uh, fluorescence color when you dose it to the tank, so it turns your tank this neon green, which is kind of cool for me. This, uh, you dose it at night, it's really cool. Uh, but then my tank is, like, colored green and I can just I, I just think liquid food small polyp corals if it's surrounded by this food or amino acid uh, that some of it's getting into the tissue and into the zooxanthellae somehow mm, yeah I mean like I, I mean the silly as it is like uh, being able to visually see like oh wow that like permeated you know the entire tank visually you can see and like it becomes more obvious, like, how the coral could actually uptake some of that stuff. Uh, you know, like, instead of kind of you dump it in and you're like, I don't know where, where to go. Yeah. <laughs> I and mean, you can see it, like, filled up the whole tank and it's going to be that way for a while. Mm. Uh, you can absolutely start to imagine how the coral would uptake uh, the amino acids that way. It's another factor that you got to factor in for export and input, too, uh, along with your feeding. That that stuff, like like the reef energy, does break down and will probably build up nitrates, phosphate, or break down to nitrates, phosphate. So you have to take that into consideration, too. But. Yeah, so for that reason, man, I just, like, wouldn't get overly hung up about, you know, I'd think more about the fish food and less about the coral food uh-huh. uh, because the coral food is probably, like, all these corals in here, like, take up, uh, you know, nutrition in a different manner, mm-hmm. right? And, like, they c- take different sizes, and you're just, like, never going to, like, get it 100% right. Man. Yeah. Like, so you just, like, spending time on that is, like, uh, pretty futile. So I just try to think about, man, fish first, right? And then, you know, try to find some simple solutions that work that will, you know, fill in the holes or the gaps, the super small stuff. Like, you know, this stuff is, like, you know, what, 50 microns, man? It's just super, super tiny. Maybe even smaller than that. Uh, one to 50 microns, mm-hmm. you know, so super, super small, and uh, you know, or at least po- a portion of it's one to 50 microns, and then it, it has a whole variety of other stuff in there. But, like, uh, uh, you know, just trying to like not overthink it. Uh, I like, you know, the the cell con, you know, we don't sell that here, but like you can find it around. Uh, Selco, if, if not, uh, and uh, you know, like frozen algae paste and stuff like that, like a uh, you know, uh, you know, phytoplankton type paste and oh, yeah. stuff like that in there. Uh, not a lot of things, uh, you know, actually uptake phytoplankton directly in the tank, but they can be the base of a you know different nutritive element. Uh, they also will break down into you know uh, nutritive elements that are can be uptaken. So like I just want to put a ton of thought about it, and like really the way that WWC talks about it a lot is like more about like what the fish poops out. You yeah, know, it's broken it down into some Already. you know easier elements, uh, and uh, so like feed the fish as much as possible. What's left over is going to feed the corals, yeah. which is kind of gross, but at the same time probably pretty <laughs> probably true. Or certainly effective. Yeah, uh, you know uh, unless you look at their tanks, you're like, oh man, they screwed it up, uh, which is nobody. Uh, you definitely see that as a working model of success. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I mean, we really covered a whole lot, man. So let's just answer a few more questions. We'll wrap this up at yeah. uh, let's see, one thirty, I guess. Uh, this one a little long, so I'll give you twelve minutes of questions here. Um, What's the best feeding schedule for a mixed reef? Best feeding schedule, man. Well, you know, so I would say if this is like a five-year robust tank, man, mm-hmm. I would probably try to feed it more than once a day. You know. I uh, try to feed it in the morning, in the evening, and uh, maybe an auto feeder on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, if this is like a five-year robust tank covered in coralline, covered in coral, in the beginning, man, uh, I would say once, once a day, yeah. you know, and keep an eye on the, the nitrate. And, like, if it's rising, either figure out a way to uh, get rid of your, uh, or up your uptake uh, or export methods, or uh, reduce the amount of food in there. End of story, man. If it's rising, you're doing something wrong. Uh, that, it's just like, that's the, the end net, net of it. You're not doing enough water changes. You are putting too much food in. You're not maintaining your skimmer. You're not maintaining the refugium. You're you know, not doing something right if it's rising. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, 
hate, I hate to say anytime, man, you're not doing anything right. But, like, <laughs> I just think that's the cool. case yeah. here, man. Like, yeah. it, uh, correct it. You should find balance. It doesn't need to be zero. It doesn't need to be five. It doesn't need to be ten. But, like, you know, figure out where the level is that you want to have or where the threshold is too far, and don't go beyond that, you yeah. know. And uh, it's pretty easy. Just stop putting so much food in. <laughs> and End of story, man. Huh. Uh, or find a way to export more. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, how important are copepods as a food source and any plans for BRS to carry live pods? Okay, so, I mean, I got some real, real distinct opinions on this one, and they're not popular. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, with uh, copepods as a food source, like live ones, been super critical for, like, a fish that relies on it, like, uh, you know, some blennies and mandarins, uh, mandarins and whatever. That's the only thing yeah. they're going to eat. And, you know, some people may go out there and say, oh, I got them deep prepared food or whatever. You're doing a disservice to uh, the fish, man, and the hobby every time you repeat that because, mm -hmm. like, most people will not have that, and you're encouraging them to go out and do this. It's super easy to take, take care of a mandarin, man. Like, you just need to, uh, you know, put in a, a solution that will, you know, keep pods fed to them. Uh, getting them to eat prepared foods is a total crapshoot. And I got to tell you, in all the years I've been doing this, I've definitely found, like, mandarins, specifically ones that have lived in, in tanks for a long time, that when they come across a pellet, they'll eat it. Mm -hmm. I have never in my whole life, man, other than, like, the ones that they bred at, uh, uh, I think it was ORA maybe, yeah. that, like, from babies, they, they have an active feeding response. But outside of those ones, I have never seen one that has an active feeding response. We put food in it, in and, like, all the other fish go looking for it. Yeah. You either just keep hunting around, pecking, That's looking true. for food. I've seen the same. So, like, I wouldn't do that. Uh, but uh, as a food source, man, and do we plan on carrying live pods? Uh, I once saw a, uh, like a, I think it was a iMac. So it's kind of like a Macna, but like deceased. Uh, it was in Chicago and like, you know, there was a speaker there who, you know, sells live, you know, pods for a living, you know, and uh uh, you know, somebody stood up and asked, man, like, why do you sell live pods, man? Like, they're going to come out of thin air. Like, I mean, not really thin air, but you're, you couldn't prevent <laughs> pods from populating the tank. And there's no way that there's enough in that bottle to actually support uh, an actual fish, man. Like, the, the mandarin, you have to dump in three of these bottles every day to take care of the mandarin for it to be a, a supportive element. Like, it's, it's just not that. Hmm. And she said, uh, well, we sell them because uh, people buy, buy them. them. <laughs> people buy them. Yeah, no good, man. <laughs> uh, you know, so, like, I just, I believe that. Uh, uh, even the person that sells it believes that. Uh -huh. Like, uh, I just don't, I think there are a way to, if you buy the little bag of pods, man, I think you can absolutely establish a population much faster. So mm. if you're starting a brand new tank and you buy some pods and you dump them in there, it is a very high likelihood that you'll get a pod population faster, provided that there's a food source for them to eat and populate right. off of. If yeah. there's no food source in there, they're all just going to die. So, you know, like, you know, if you put in, like, you know, some you know, a pile of food or something there somewhere or throw in a dead shrimp or something, you know, like uh, they'll populate around that. But uh, outside of that, man, to sell live pods, man, I just, I would only sell them, man, for that purpose. And in which case, man, I don't even really think, I think you're better off, man, not getting them through distribution. Uh, you know, of fish we love making stuff. money here as much as anybody else, but like I'd rather that you just go to a place like LG Barn that grows them there mm -hmm. uh, and then ships them to you direct because the chances that they're going to be, you know, live and do what you want them to do just skyrocketed when they didn't like end up in a warehouse somewhere and, you know, who knows how long they sat on somebody's shelf yeah. somewhere. So, uh, you know, I'd go to LG Barn and probably buy them direct from them. Or maybe I'd, I actually, you know, another one I do is I'd buy them from a fish store, man, where I can, like, look in the bag and say, oh, yeah, they're in there. Oh, yeah, sometimes uh, I've been to some fish stores that just have these, uh, they're little pod hotels or, you know, uh, little corrugated type plastic, you know, stacks, you know, stacks of them. And they may turn them into these little squares. And they'll just drop them in different parts of the sumps around the shop. And you can go into the you can go into the shop, and they'll take a little uh, one of those little pod things, and they'll drop it in a bag for you with some water, and you see pods just crawling around all over in them, and then they'll charge your price, and out the door you go. Live pods, just like that. So last bit on this is uh, I want to make sure that uh, I get it come across right. I think pods and amphipods, copepods, all that kind of microfauna is super super valuable to a tank. Like uh, it's super critical. 
and you know maintaining balance in the tank they eat algae they scavenge they do all kinds of super positive things uh, but if you add a couple corals to your tank I think you'll find that it's impossible to keep them out. They're hard to see, you know, so you don't know that they're there, but they're almost always there. Throw a refugium in there, throw a hang on one if you, you can't put a normal one on, that will do just fine. Uh, and uh, like valuable, I just wouldn't go buying them. And I, I honestly don't even know if I'd buy the live cultures for cycling. Cause I just, you just can't not have pods in the tank. They'll cough, <laughs> they, you know, on their own, they'll populate. It's, magic. it's the speed at which they happen is uh, a different thing. Uh, All right, uh, what else we have here? Does feeding affect ORP? Oh, that's an interesting one. Uh, yeah, it should. Uh, so uh, ORP is the balance of the amount of oxidants in the water, uh, you know, against, I think, you know, I'm going to butcher this, so I'm not going to say it, but balance of the oxygen or the oxidants, and I think, uh, you know. Man, Got me. That's oxidants and maybe organics in the water or whatever. Right. But if I increase the amount of organics in the water, then all of a sudden, somebody's going to kill me because I didn't get this exactly right. But uh, uh, all of a sudden, the amount of oxidants will go down because they're, you know, attacking the organics in the water. Uh, so, yeah, it'll make the ORP go down, but, like, does it matter? No. Nah. Nah, like, I, unless you're running ozone, man, I, I, I wouldn't bother with ORP. ORP. I mean, all. if you gave me a free probe, I'd put it in, you know, and uh, watch trend. like anything, yeah, I would like watch it yeah. and see, you know, I'd set up an alarm if it goes super high or super low because, you know, super low probably means like some gigantic amount of fish died in the tank mm -hmm. or, or something, man. Something really bad just went down. <laughs> uh, but like, it's not the great, most important thing to do. Yeah. All right, I got four minutes left. Uh, all That's right. Do you turn uh, Do you turn off power heads when you feed? I, I mean, you can. You don't have to. Uh, I, don't, I I was I've kind of done both. And feeding this tank, uh, I don't. I've never. I haven't shut them off. I let it broadcast, fly all over the place. You see the fish like actively swimming after it and chasing it and stuff like that. It's cool to watch, uh, but it's also cool like when I turn the power heads off in my tank and I go in there with a little cube of shrimp and my clownfish comes up and he bites my fingers and the cube and bites my fingers. So I mean you're interacting with your with your pets. So uh, both, you know, but. Uh, like like we were saying, you know, it's if uh, if you're worried about, and I think the big conversation like when I, that I remember uh, reading in the forums and coming up in the hobby was, I turn your power heads off so you can see every single particle go in every single fish mouth, and you know you're not polluting your tank with unnecessary nitrates and phosphates because the food's going to break down. Uh, uh, like Ryan was saying, I think we're kind of past that on as far as balancing your export to your input. And I'm comfortable with taking a, a bunch of food or a turkey baster full of food, squirting it in the tank, letting it go all over the place, and then just kind of watch him swim and chase it. So, Yeah, I agree, man. Uh, I just don't uh, – this is what I say for sure, is if you have to unplug them or manually turn them off, don't do it. Man. Like, just <laughs> yeah. don't do it. Because eventually you'll just leave. Forget. The, you forget off. Yeah. And, like, when I say eventually, it could be tomorrow. Right. And, and, like, like it will happen for sure. So, like, and the benefits of turning them off in most cases don't reach that at all. If you have, like, a little feed mode, like, on your Apex or whatnot, like, uh, yeah, why not, man? Like, uh, you know, specifically turn off your maybe your return pumps yeah. uh, so all the food stays in there for a little while. But and it will automatically turn back on for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe, it, you know, I don't know. I, I like the power heads to be on to some degree, to be honest. But, like, uh, uh, you know, blow the food around, get it to where it needs to go. Uh, but, yeah, I would never do it unless I had an automatic way to do mm -hmm. it. All right. So uh, we're going to answer one more and call it a day. What else we got here? The best one. Uh so if a healthy fish take a while to eat, do you follow the two-minute rule? What's the two-minute rule, man? Oh, as much as they can eat within two minutes and then oh. be done feeding. Uh, kind of goes back to that same. No, nah, man. Follow, pay attention to your fish, man. Like, so some fish are like super finicky eaters. In fact, you know, something like a copper band or whatever will be the last to eat. So, you know, sometimes with a fish like that, either got to build some kind of contraption that only it can eat out of or whatnot. Mm. Or you simply need to let the other fish gorge themselves to the point they don't really want anymore and then come, and back. Then come back and feed him again, uh, right? Yeah. And make sure 
you know, uh, often with really finicky fish like that, or like maybe like twin scot bot gobies or something, part of the nature of what you're going to be doing here is you know full well you're going to be adding more food than the tank really needs, and so you better up your export game uh, and pay attention to what you're doing. But yeah, I don't know, two minutes? I never had that rule. Uh, I never had any rule like that in my life. I've heard of it. So yeah, I just put food in that matches the nutrient and seems the fish seem to grow and be healthy. Yeah. All right. That's all right. It. I'm on 30. I'm going to go one more. I just can't help it. it. All right. So uh, (laughs) let's see here. Uh, I mean, Happy New Year, Uh, BRS and family. Hey, thank you very much, man. I'm going to go out. Like I said, for those of you who missed it, uh, uh, my life is super lame. So I'm going to go out (laughs) here uh, with my wife and my two-month-old baby and celebrate New Year's at uh, 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, Well, I babysit my (laughs) two-and-a-half-year-old if somebody does that. And uh, that's the story of my life. Is how awesome it is. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are at midnight. Yeah, wish me luck. All right. That's a good one. Uh, how are the BRS one hundred and sixty twin spots? Oh man, so they're dead. Sorry. Uh, the BRS one hundred and sixty twin spots. I mean, those are my favorite fish. I'm never gonna have them again. Uh, I just, I, sorry, man. I tough. killed, I killed yeah. enough of them now. Uh, they're the, the coolest fish, man. I, I for me, uh, but. They're sand sifting fish, and they're super uh, finicky eaters. Fin- for not sure. just finicky eaters, man. They're like shy and easily startled mm-hmm. and whatnot. And so the way I was taking care of them, I was taking uh, like reef chili and I was clannis and cyclopods and like you know getting all that stuff, and I was putting it into a you know, cup. Uh, oh yeah, this guy, man. Uh, and then what we put it in a cup and then soak it all up into the thing put a little piece of uh, airline tubing, airline tubing yeah. and then an acrylic tube on it and what we do is squeeze it you know put the thing underneath the sand in front of them in front of their face yeah in front of their face <laughs> and, and spray the food into the sand so when they're sifting the sand they're sifting out all the calanus and everything and eventually man I trained them so they would actually eat right out of the end of the tube you know the stuff mm-hmm. like right? they they had a feeding response and they knew that this was food uh, and they were doing really well until we got uh, the Monty Eden Nudie Bronx in here, and uh, when we had those, we added a six line rasp that terrorized them and just killed them. Terrorized, yeah. Uh, and so, and they're just super hard fish. And so that's what I'm going to say, man. If you're going to try to have those twin spot gobies, man, I don't personally know anybody who's been successful with those fish. Uh, I'm sure there are, there are people out there, and they should share their you know successful mm-hmm. tactics. I would say a tremendous amount of sand, low aggression fish. Might be some of the um, only fish that you have in there, yeah, just so you can. It probably you know target feeding them, and when you think like, oh yeah, I'll target feed them, like say, oh yeah, I'll target them for 15 years. Not man, like a, not a month, man. Like you're gonna take care of this as your pet, and this is one of the things you need to do every day, all the time. Take care of your pet, man. Uh, and uh, like can't think about it, like. You know, you should wash those poor fish. If you try to feed them like uh, like uh, mysis or whatever, they'll definitely go eat it. But they're like desperately trying to gum it, you know, and it's not providing nutrition yeah. for them. It's not their natural diet. So, huh. all right, well, we're gonna call that a cool. day, man. Uh, and uh, happy New Year to everybody. Yeah. Uh, you know, hopefully you have a way cooler uh, uh, New Year's Eve than I will have. I'm, I'm certain that Randy will. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I look forward to, uh, on Friday. We're going to do another live. I'm writing the calcium uh, 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 or trace minor and major elements for the hybrid thing as we speak. Uh, it's getting further every day. So we should be back on track next week. Yeah, next Friday, man, we're back into the, the mix of things. And I got to tell you, in support of that, behind it, you know, all those things like we're you know, breaking things down, like stuff we know universally true, and then there's all this debatable stuff. It's a debatable stuff that we're going to come back to with BRS Investigates yeah. and really, like, dig in, man, and find uh, out, like, uh, like, let's stop talking this debate. Let's, like, uh, prove it one way or the other. Yeah. So I actually am the most excited to, like, get past uh, the hybrid method, let the tank start growing out, mm-hmm. and get into proven stuff. So uh, we hired another guy for the BRS lab, or we haven't hired him yet, but we put the job posting up. Uh, and uh, you know, some somebody to monkey around with tanks all day. Oh yeah, Aaron Aaron's operation back there is going to go doubly. Yeah, hopefully, fast, man, so. we just start jamming. Yeah. So happy New Year, everybody! Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next year. All right, see you guys. Sweet.